So well, I know that the previous battles inside of the Tokyo colony were pure fire. However, we are now flying over to another colony where the battles have escalated far, far quicker, quickly surpassing the brutality of Tokyo, turning the bustling city of Sendai into a domain of pure viciousness. Just before we do get into the video though, if you are new around here and want to watch more content just like this where I go over a bunch of arcs and fights from throughout a bunch of different series, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and also be sure to leave a like on the video as it really helps out with pushing my content to a bunch of new amazing people. So yes, just like I previously mentioned, we have now left the Tokyo Colony number 1 where Yuchi and Megami are to fly over to Gege's other main character. They no longer depressed Yuta Okotsu who's currently in the Sendai Colony. There are currently four powerhouses at the center of the conflict, and just like the Tokyo colony, Sendai here has also reached a deadlock due to only the powerhouses being left over. Drew like Dewala is a veteran of the Civil War of Wa, a war in which it was like literally him versus everyone else, so the dude must have been pure insanity. It's explained that he currently sits at 91 points and has the ability to use two kinds of independent Shikigami that can compose a domain with their like orbiting thingies. Somewhere else inside of the Sendai colony, we find a damn Jojo character under the name of Ryu Ishigori. This man currently sits at 77 points and has the highest cursed energy output of all of the players in the culling game. So like, does he even surpass Yuta perhaps? Anyway, shooting over to another powerhouse called Takako Uro, it's explained that this babe of a character is the former captain of the Sun, Moon and Star squads, who are a group of deadly assassins directly affiliated with the Fujiwara clan. Which in our own world, the Fujiwara clan prospered for around 1200 years from the 600s, dominating the imperial court until 1868. So, Gege being Gege has probably taken her directly from a specific time period throughout those 1200 years. And assuming she's insanely strong, it was probably during the Golden Period or the Heian Period of uh, 794 through 1185 where they held most of their dominance in the court. Anyways, skipping over to this bug who's Kuroroshi, which is a special grade cockroach curse that Kenjaku had released from Ghetto's curse spirit manipulation, and it was probably one of those like very few special grades Ghetto was keeping hidden during the night parade. It's explained that it currently has 54 points and is lying dormant until the unfavorable conditions disappear. Due to their conflicting abilities and natures, the four powerhouses force their standoff rather than an alliance. However, the deadlock falls apart when one side eventually collapses. Druv like Dewala, yes that old school fart is cut down by Tokyo Jujutsu High's infamous second year student, Yuta Akotsu, who now has 35 points, so like man has literally been going demon mode throughout this part of the story. Remember how uh, he had also lost his uh, ranking after the end of JJK Zero? Well it's explained here that he reclaimed his rank 3 months after the night parade of a hundred demons and still possesses unusual strength second only to Satoru Gojo. So the hype for this battle is absolutely insane right now. Takako and Ryu who are nearby observe the developing situation in the Sendai colony. Due to Yuta being himself, Druv like Dewala has fallen and his patrolling Shikigami are disappearing. Ryu uses his cocaine to check who defeated Druv and discovers the player is Yuta Akotsu. Takako does the same and while she's glad the ugly Shikigami are disappearing, she's concerned about a new threat that will surely emerge. Back with Ryu, he realizes that he was only able to get close to Druv without provoking him before because he was occupied in battle with Yuta. These two new sorcerers both know that following Druv's defeat, Kuroroshi will likely emerge next. Back over with our boy though, after cutting down Druv, he regroups with a crowd of civilians he's been protecting. He tells them that it's time to head north to the edge of the barrier, but notices a mother and daughter struggling to go on. Because of this, he changes his mind and tells all of the civilians they can rest inside of the stadium that was serving as Druv's base. Suddenly though, he's interrupted by a buzzing and clattering sound that indicates some sort of danger. Yuta immediately orders everyone to hurry inside of the stadium and he draws his katana. He looks out and sees an overwhelming swarm of cockroaches chasing people. It's funny like cutting myself off for a second, Yuta is like a Megami Yuji fusion, like the best of both worlds. Man will merc anyone when necessary and also save the helpless as much as possible. Anyways anyways, our JJK Hannah Montana jumps forth thinking he can save the remaining man, but as Yuta grabs the man's arm, he's unable to pull him away in time and sadly the cockroaches devour the civilian's lower body. Then as the cockroaches jump from the man's body to attack, Yuta quickly blocks with his katana and notices that all of the bugs are indeed real insects reinforced with cursed energy. The swarm attempts to rush past Yuta to ravage the other civilians, but he summons Rika to stop them. The demonic powerhouse herself then uses that cursed devil IQ and smashes down on a bridge collapsing the structure on top of the swarm, forcing it to go back towards Yuta. 
The special grade sorcerer then imbues his katana with cursed energy and swings it with enough force to create a large blast of cursed energy that disintegrates the whole swarm in one shot. Watching the action from afar, Ryu comments that while Yuta's cursed energy output isn't anything special, his overall cursed energy manipulation is extremely impressive. Also observing, Sakako outright states that Yuta's overall cursed energy is bottomless and that the cockroach curses are disgusting. So this El Bugo, it's explained that he was a poor matchup for Dhruv, so to play things safe, it went into like a dormant state until Dhruv was eliminated. The curse has an endless appetite and eating stimulates its ability to perform parthenogenesis, which in our monkey brain terms, and that took me five times to say, just means this creepy old bug can self-reproduce not needing a male or female partner. Now awakened, the cockroach curse is starving and its instincts immediately lead it to devour Yuta. While preparing to face off against Kuroroshi, Yuta ponders his objective in this colony. He knows his resources are finite and it's only a matter of time before a rule allowing passage in and out of colonies is added. However, dangerous players like Truve can't be allowed to leave the barrier either. With the likelihood that there are other players just like him, Yuta knows that communication between colonies is necessary to prevent anyone dangerous from leaving them. In addition to the rules Megami proposed in the meeting with Tengen, Yuta understands his allies need a means of communication and a way to move in and out of the colonies. So in total, that's four rules the group needs to create to get a handle on the culling game. Which is actually insane, because that's at least 400 points or a majority of the reincarnations Kenjaku has actually brought back. Anyways, Yuta feels that the Shibuya incident exhausted all of his allies and he doesn't want to make his sensei kill his best friend again. Poised and ready to engage the enemy player with his katana, Yuta resolves to kill Kenjaku and obtain 400 points all on his own. So let the absolute bloodbath begin. Noticing Yuta's battle stance, Kuroshi bulks up and reveals a curse tool called the Festering Life Sword, an enchanted blade that mixes life and death itself. Armed with the Festering Life Sword, Kuroshi ferociously attacks, only to have his arm immediately cut off by Yuta. The sorcerer then uses his katana to pin the curse's arm to a rock, literally disarming it by turning the arm into a freaking barbecue sword skewer. Yuta then quickly follows up with a dead level backhand strike that sends Kuroshi skidding back across the water. The cockroach curse tries to fly up above the bridge, but Yuta, who's just too damn quick, jumps on top of the bridge first, then grabs and flings a piece of railing that hits Kuroshi in the chest. Taking this moment, Yuta capitalizes on the opening he created by sending Kuroroshi down into the water below with a sick diving slash. As the water clears though, it's revealed that the curse managed to stop Yuta's blade by using a swarm of cockroaches. Yuta swipes the swarm away with a sword while Kuroroshi manipulates his bugs into a twister of cockroaches to malevolently stand on. Below, Yuta is aware that he's been watched by the two other players with high scores. He knows he can easily exercise Kuroroshi by driving reverse curse energy into his body in a similar fashion to how he revived Yuji in their fight. However, Yuta doesn't want the observing players to see that he can use a reverse curse technique. Additionally, he can't call on Rika because she's protecting everyone else at the stadium. Kuroroshi is indeed a dangerous opponent, but Yuta wants to exercise it without relying on either of his two backup techniques. Out of nowhere though, this bug somehow manages to speak, which, you know, actually makes sense as over time special grades can like easily develop a language. Anyways, it asks Yuta why he's interfering with his feeding, referring to not letting him munch down on those civilians back there, to which Yuta responds by asking the curse why it kills people, and Kuroroshi simply replies that it likes the taste of iron. Then going on to chant binding over and over again, Kuroroshi uses its earthen insect trance technique to summon small insect-like curses that carry these unproportionate looking nutsacks with them. Instantly, a swarm of cockroaches shoot down and around Yuta, forcing him to stab the shallow water below him to create a shockwave allowing him to hide. Once the swarm dissipates, the curses from Kuroroshi's previous technique attack Yuta from behind. Yuta slashes them apart, but sadly the toxins from their big ass sacks blind him for a moment, giving Kuroroshi an opening. The cockroach curse retrieves the festering life sword and slashes at his target. Yuta manages to block with his katana, but the festering life sword shoots something into his shoulder. As a boy darts back, he figured that the curse tool might be able to shoot projectiles, but he instantly realizes something's wrong, and more insect-like curses suddenly grow out of his shoulder wound. Taken by surprise, Yuta tries to cut them off with his katana, but this gives Kuroroshi another opening to attack. Closing in, the cockroach curse slashes Yuta across his abdomen, opening up another wound and causing more curses to spawn from it. 
Ryu and Takako watch in shock as Kuroroshi then grabs Yuta's body, fully expecting it to devour him. Yuta though plays the infamous Uno reversal and grabs the curse's face before sinking his teeth into Kuroroshi's exoskeleton. Then, as he's munching down, he drives a reverse curse energy blast through his teeth into the cockroach, compromising the integrity of its body and exercising the special grade curse. Kuroshi falls to pieces while Yuta spits its remains onto the ground, earning himself another 5 points from Kogang. With the curse spirit out of the way and Yuta in a vulnerable state, Uru decides to take advantage of the situation and confronts him directly. Levitating upside down behind a new rival, Uru whispers into Yuta's ear, taking him by surprise. Before Yuta can confront the danger directly though, Uru uses their Dopas curse technique to heavily distort the space around them. Instantly, this distortion fractures the terrain around her and launches Yuta backwards. Taking the hit head on, Yuta minimizes the damage and starts to wonder how exactly she caused so much destruction. But before he has time to think, Uro follows up her attack with a punch. Yuta is just able to weave past the hit and tries to counter with a punch of his own. However, Uro grips down and warps the sky around his fist, completely stopping his counter attack and turning his hand into some spaghetti ass noodle. Which like reminds me of Harry's hand after the Quidditch game in Chamber of Secrets. Anyways, anyways, while Yuta stands there confused by his distorted appendage, Uro knocks him back with another attack. Now out of combat, Yuta's arm quickly returns to normal without any damage, leading Yuta to assume Uro's curse technique manipulates space without actually crushing anything within it, similar to how like a lens creates distortion. It's just an idea, but I, I wonder if she could also create some sort of pocket dimension or wormhole. Like, hear me out, it does sound kind of crazy. But if she could grab two specific points in space and distort those points to make them touch, technically that's how we think a wormhole might work over a 3D plane, and from that it opens up the series to like the idea of time travel or a high domain like the fourth dimension or something. Anyways, anyways, that sounds a bit bizarre. The reason I say this is because Uru discloses her ability right now and reveals her curse technique treats the sky as a surface. For example, Uru can physically grab an open space, making it a tangible object which in turn allows her to manipulate it as if it was some sort of curtain. Both of her previous attacks on Yuta bypasses the fences and sent him flying, so he figures that there must be some sort of trick to her ability if warped surfaces are able to accomplish that. Impatiently, Uru waits for her opponent to attack so she can counter with her technique, but instead Yuta asks her a question. He asks if Uru wouldn't complain if she were to be killed and why exactly she's seeking out conflict. He understands that powerless people get desperate, but this doesn't apply to Uro because her curse technique makes her such a formidable opponent compared to the majority of other sorcerers in the culling game. Uro explains to him that she doesn't take receiving a new body lightly, as essentially, incarnated sorcerers have returned from the Shadow Realm. She feels like someone without regret wouldn't have joined the culling game in the first place. So, as the first step in her new life, she is prioritizing points, and that's why she's attacking. Still confused, probably even like more than us reading right now because that made no sense to me what she said there. Yuta asks if Uro has a lover or a companion she's fighting for. The reason he asks this is because he simply can't understand why someone would spend time killing people thousands of years later even if they have regrets. Listening to Yuta blabber on though, Uro gets more and more pissed off, all culminating in the point where Yuta asks her how she could possibly be so desperate that she'd only return for her own selfish gain. Irate and literally blowing blood vessels on her dome, Uro asks if Yuta is a descendant of the Fujiwara clan, claiming that someone of his blood wouldn't ever understand her. Which I don't think he is, he's a Michizani's descendant, so I don't think that's Fujiwara. Someone let me know down in the comment section below. Ryu though, remember that like random, apparently OP Jojo's character from before? Well his ass interrupts the conversation by using his insane granite blast to fire a massive wave of cursed energy from his head at both players, leaving the previously beautiful city now just a pile of rubble. Having attacked from a nearby rooftop, Ryu claims Yuta and Uro's flirting is making him hungry for battle. Uru decides that there's no reason to let Ryu go now, now that the colony's deadlock is broken. Yuta and Uru simultaneously decide it's time to take Ryu out. They both dash in straight towards Ryu, exciting the long range fighter who responds with a volley of cursed energy beams that weave after the approaching fighters. Yuta is narrowly able to avoid the initial barrage using his agility, but a second wave of attacks appears to take him off guard, decimating him and the bridge he's standing on. However, once the smoke clears, Ryu, who thought he landed a direct hit, notices that Yuta is gone. Suddenly, Yuta leaps up from behind onto the roof to confront Ryu directly, forcing him to realize that Yuta used the hole Rika made in the bridge to avoid the beams and get out of sight. Having successfully closed the distance between them, Yuta attacks the ancient sorcerer directly, before darting back into his fighting pose and declaring that it's time to bring the fight into a closer range. 
Amused by Yuda's display of skill, Ryu asks if fighting up close will satisfy his hunger. Elaborating on his comment, Ryu asks if someone should tell a child in front of her face to calm down and eat slowly. Yuda suggests that someone should do that, and Ryu actually agrees, admitting that it was probably a bad example. Lighting up a Sigi, Ryu says he didn't have any major regrets in his first life where he fought worthy opponents and had met a good woman. Even so, he still suffers from a thirst that no one understands, and because of that, he's still unsatisfied. He says that cigarettes have a sweet aftertaste, but his life has never had that kind of dessert. Instantly, Ryu unleashes a flurry of attacks, causing Yuta to quickly respond with punches of his own, giving them both a chance to feel for each other's combat prowess. Yuta notes that Ryu has an explosive cursed energy output combined with very precise and quick movements. Even with Yuta's advanced toughness, a direct hit from Ryu would cause significant damage. After exchanging several blows and parrying one another, both fighters turn to land a spinning attack. However, Ryu clashes his back against Yuta and expels a blast of cursed energy that sends the latter flying back off the roof. Yuta crashes through the top of another building, losing his footing for a moment, but quickly manages to regain his balance. Immediately, Ryu having noticed his stumble follows up with another granite blast attack, sending a beam of energy directly at Yuta. But somehow, Yuta is able to deflect it with his bare freaking hands like some Harry Potter spell without a wand level of hold. Holy shit. Then Yuta in a damn flash quickly closes the distance and tries to crush his opponent with a fierce right hook to the dome, crushing Ryu into the roof and cracking the concrete floor below him. However, it actually seems that Ryu had conned him into a false sense of security, as he counters with another beam of cursed energy that Yuta is unable to fully overpower. As he blasts Yuta back, Ryu tells him that you are my dessert. Uro, who's like just rolled up on the scene, takes advantage of Yuta's unfavorable positioning in midair and targets him with her cursed technique. It's explained that technically she doesn't hit the person with her technique, but strikes the surface of the sky instead. Having revealed the extent of her technique, Uro breaks the surface like thin ice and smacks your opponent straight down onto the brick road below. Irritated by the interference, Ryu shoots a wave of cursed energy at Uro and tells her that she's in his way. Telling him to silence himself though, Uro uses her technique to warp the space around the cursed energy beam, firing it right back at him and hitting him directly. Injured, Yuta then manages to return to the battlefield which amuses Uro who claims it's great that he's tough as she's going to toy with him. Our Jojo wannabe who's still recovering from his own attack notices that Yuta is constantly using his reverse curse technique to heal himself and using up all of his near bottomless curse energy. Let down by his opponent's receding strength, Ryu comes to the conclusion that Yuta is not the dessert he had been searching for to quench his gluttonous thirst. Thinking on what to do himself, Yuta knows that Ryu doesn't target civilians, but he wouldn't care if they ended up as collateral damage in an attack. Yuta knows that he wanted to put more distance between the fighting and the stadium where the civilians are just in case, but that isn't likely to happen anymore. Instead, Yuta decides to use his full strength now. He pulls out and puts on his ring, then calls upon Rika and asks her to give him everything. Rika suddenly manifests as a cursed spirit right next to him, leaving both Ryu and Uro confused by this turn of events. Uro is shocked Yuta wasn't already using his full power, and Ryu doesn't understand how Yuta's cursed energy is already filling back up. For those of you like confused, think of Rika like a water tank of cursed energy, and when Yuta decides to open that tap, he can just refill his deflated cursed energy. On top of that, Rika tears open her chest to display a freaking arsenal of cursed tools kept inside her body for Yuta to choose from. So Rika the Curse is technically different to Rika Orimoto, and once the young child spirit peacefully passed away at the end of JJK Zero, the curse spirit itself stayed directly connected to Yuta's ring, and while the connection is active, Rika is capable of storing curse energy for Yuta, completing her full manifestation to aid him in battle, and can even supply curse tools for him, though he can only maintain the sustained connection for up to like 5 minutes. Having chosen the metal arm, Rika attaches the casing around Yuta's right arm to improve his overall striking power. Ready to re-engage in the now three-way battle, Yuta begins by having Rika soar through the air towards Uro, who now prepares her sky manipulation technique in response. However, Yuta suddenly creates the prolific snake eyes and fang sigil of the Inumaki clan on his mouth and activates cursed speech, commanding all of his opponents to not move. Uro tries to cover her ears, but she's just too late, and is immediately immobilized, which I wonder if that implies that the Inumaki clan had been around from the time that Uro was previously alive, as she reacted like she knew what the ability was. Anyways, unable to defend herself, Uro was pummeled by a large barrage of strikes from both Yuta and Rika, sending her shooting off. 
Yuta then drops down and launches himself off Rika's arms like he's a goddamn volleyball towards Uro, continuing to pressure her. Ryu tries to intervene in their fight and launches a beam of cursed energy, claiming that Yuta's approach is too soft. Rika though cuts it off and slices the attack in half with one hand, impressing Ryu, who believes that Rika might be even more durable than Yuta himself. Irritated by the pain, Rika angrily lashes out, punching Ryu in the face and sending him flying off the roof. He tries to follow up with another strike, but Ryu quickly counters with an explosive punch of his own, smashing Rika back into the roof of an opposing building. Excited with the potential to satisfy his hunger, Ryu fixes his hair and claims he has an appetite that calls for an extra large helping. Back with the other two though, Yuta summons a bunch of small flying Shikigami by using strands of his hair as an intermediary. Uru destroys one of them using her technique and claims that members of the Fujiwara only stand in her way because they fear her true potential. Going on that typical anime level spiel, she explains that she is the leader of the Sun, Moon and Star squads affiliated directly with the Toh of the Fujiwara clan. They were assassins that pursued lives of selfless devotion in the shadows and didn't even bear names. A particular sorcerer of the Fujiwara clan though gave Takako her name, only to execute her as a proxy to cover up his own crimes of killing someone else in the clan. Suddenly though, Uro is cut off mid-sentence and cut across her chest and hips by the Shikigami. The trajectories of the Shikigami constitute a domain, which Uro immediately recognises as Drew's technique. Remember like that old man from the very beginning of the fight? She realises that Yuta isn't a cursed speech user with the ability to summon Shikigami, instead he's a sorcerer with the ability to copy others' cursed techniques. Yuta proceeds to follow up and knocks Uro down to where Ryu and Rika are fighting. He tries to capitalise with a straight punch, but Uro manages to stop his attack and break his armoured shell with the icebreaker effect of her technique. Uninjured by this exchange though, Yuta tells Uro that regardless of what his ancestors may have done, living for herself will only get her so far. Yet, those words just hit a complete block and only serve to further annoy Uro who claims that saying things like live for others is something only those who have achieved something can do. Their conversation is interrupted though, when they both notice a massive surge in Ryu's curse energy. Ryu thinks his opponents need to shut up because words are utterly pointless at this stage of the fight. Are you guys all ready? As the three of them suddenly look at each other prepared to bring their three way battle to a climax, the trio of Sendai's strongest sorcerers all activate their domain expansion simultaneously. Instantly, and like because of the three overlapping domains, they cancel each other's short hit functions out. Without that advantage, Ryu and Uro know that they need to stop Yuta from taking the initiative by keeping Rika out of the barrier. Ryu knows that he had already knocked Rika over 20 meters away, so it was unlikely she would be able to reach the barrier in time. But outside, it's shown that the last vestiges of Rika Orimoto's will inside of Rika couldn't accept that she was unable to protect Yuta, causing her strength to ratchet up another notch. Suddenly, Kuroroshi, yes, remember that damn cockroach from back at the beginning of the video that just got murked by Yuta, randomly appears and infiltrates the freaking barrier while its cockroaches outside occupy Rika. So, remember how I said this dude was able to self-reproduce and all that kind of stuff? Well, before going dormant, Kuroroshi actually reproduced via his parthenogenesis. After Yuta exercised the parent roach, the country's cursed energy of fear was transferred into the new offspring. Kuroroshi, the player, is indeed perished, but Kuroroshi, the cursed spirit, is still completely active. Three overlapping domains are more complex than two, and the conditions imbued within their barriers complicate things even further. With the addition of an unexpected intruder, the barriers are completely compromised and begin to shatter, falling to pieces. Falling out themselves, Yuna notices that Uro is totally focused on Kuroroshi. Obviously this is due to her technique being at a complete disadvantage with the roach. Because of this, Yuna takes the opportunity and literally kicks Uro in the back while she's distracted, sending her flying towards the ground almost like cementing her death. Seeing her coming down, the cursed roach rushes towards her with the festering life sword. Uru tries to respond by activating her curse technique, however, as we all know from the past events with Mahito, curse techniques are difficult to use immediately after using a domain expansion, and Uru's ability to manipulate space burns away in her hands, leaving her open to Kuroroshi's assault. The roach curse slashes Uro's left arm, and quickly, these disgusting insect-like curses spawn from the wound, severing her limb completely. Rika, who's also there, acts quickly by devouring Uro's arm before the roach could, impressing Ryu. He notes that Yuta is thorough, and that it's unlikely that Uro can regenerate her entire arm, even if she uses a reverse curse technique. Irate over the loss of her arm, Uro angrily calls out to the Fujiwara descendant. 
cutting her off though, Ryu tells her to stop because she and Kuroshi aren't invited to his table. Yes, if you have noticed, everything to do with Ryu Ishiguri has something to do with eating food, like the dessert thing from earlier, or now the whole like, you ain't invited to this table, you can't eat from this table type thing. Anyway, anyway, it's explained that Ryu's curse technique is called Cursed Energy Discharge, and he's the only sorcerer capable of outputting the same amount of power, regardless of if his technique is active or not. Instantly, he blasts Uro and Kuroshi with another jacked up granite blast, incapacitating Uro and partially destroying Kuroshi, making it simple for Yuta to exercise with his reverse curse energy. Excited for his dessert now, Ryu fixes his drip and welcomes Yuta to the table. He charges his cursed energy and takes aim, while opposite him, Yuta knows that his own curse technique has yet to replenish. But with Yuta and Rika working together to counter the ancient sorcerer's next move, the table is set for their final battle. As then explain that Yuta can only unleash a direct beam of cursed energy while Rika is completely manifested. Even at full power, Yuta's blasts are slightly weaker than Ryu's. In order to win the exchange, Yuta intends on rapidly building up cursed energy and firing first before Ryu reaches maximum power. However, Ryu's eyes express over 400 years of hunger waiting to be satiated and his gaze pleads with Yuta to use his full power. Although Yuta would never find true meaning in conflict, Ryu's gaze melted his heart. Melted my damn heart as well, look at those eyes, it's so damn beautiful. Anyways, Yuta agrees to go all out on this just once, and both sorcerers unleash their curse energy. The blasts collide in a curse energy beam struggle that's extremely reminiscent of an old school DBZ blast off. Sadly though, Yuta is quickly overpowered by Ryu's blast. The duo are seemingly hit and sent back into a nearby building, which Ryu immediately expresses how sweet the first taste of his dessert was. The gleeful sorcerer is quickly surprised though, when he begins to feel his opponent's cursed energy swelling up. Wanting the meal he desires, he screams and asks for another beam struggle. In retaliation, Rika fires a blast of cursed energy while Yuta simultaneously rushes forward. It's shown that Yuta actually jumped forward at the exact same time the blast hit, launching him at high speed towards the enemy sorcerer. Rika is also able to shoot completely on her own, but Ryu believes he's jacked enough and somehow he blocks the beam with his bare hands as well, claiming that he can do whatever Yuta can. He takes aim at Yuta and expects to finish him off with his next attack, due to the cursed energy he extended on top of just using a domain expansion. However, as his granite blast shoots out, and unbeknownst to Ryu, Yuta's curse technique had already replenished. He takes this moment and uses Oro's ability to warp space, redirecting Ryu's blast up into the air. Shocked, Ryu realizes that Yuta can actually copy people's curse techniques and tries to surmise what condition he must fulfill to do so. He recalls Rika devouring Uro's arm and figures that that must have been when he satiated the condition. Yuta notices Ryu's lack of focus, capitalizing on it, and scores a direct hit to Ryu's chest with Uro's thin icebreaker move. Quickly, he follows up with another combination downward punch using Rika that hits so hard it causes Ryu to begin bleeding profusely from his head. So remember how there was like a time limit on Rika's manifestation? Well, five minutes have now passed since Yuta donned his ring, causing the connection between him and Rika to actually end. Ryu takes advantage of this by hitting Rika with his full power, an attack that was too much for her to handle even while fully manifested. Because of this, Rika quickly reaches her limit and disappears from the battle, leaving Yuta to continue fighting on his own. The big man himself, Ryu, is excited that there's even more to their battle, even after clashing at full power. He happily declares that this final course is the dessert he has been longing for. Standing there, Yuta surprises the Ancient One by grabbing him with both hands and pushing their weight down so hard that it cracks the ground beneath their feet. After effectively immobilizing them both, Yuta claims that the fight is over, confusing Ryu. While Ishigori is looking down at the cracked ground, his granite blast from earlier, yes remember that one Yuta shot up into the sky using Uro's technique? Well, it rains down directly on Ryu and surprises the unsuspecting sorcerer, completely toasting him. Still standing there though, like, like an actual champion, but still defeated, Ryu quickly realizes that he was just hit by his own beam, as Yuta redirected it back down using Uro's technique at the same time Rika had hit him. Despite his defeat, Ryu is satisfied with the high level of battle he participated in, and thanks Yuta, now that his stomach is finally full. Not gonna lie, Gege knows the terminology of these scenes so damn well, and we all just ate as well as Ryu Ishigori did right here, boys. Anyways, anyways, following the end of the battle in the Sendai colony, Yuta first talks to the defeated Uro in order to retrieve her points. 
She tells Yuta this like extremely ominous statement that probably will 100% play a role later on in the story. She says that his strength has a limit and she's seen a power beyond the horizon of the strongest fighters and curses with her very own eyes. In that moment, she imagines Sukuna's original form and claims that such power takes the form of overwhelming aggression that disregards anything else like a calamity. Yuta then moves on to Ryu who tells him that he's too soft and he won't receive praise for his actions. Yuta replies to him though that Takako also told him something similar, that there was no value in sparing an opponent's life. Having heard this, Ryu is surprised to learn that Uru survived and believes his blast must have been weakened after using domain expansion. Which, like I brought up earlier, makes sense as most of the time after using a domain someone's technique will slightly falter in comparison to before the domain was used. Anyways anyways, Ryu sits up and asks what Uru kept getting upset about during the fight and asks if it was a lover's quarrel. Yuta tries blowing him off, but after persisting, explains that anything he could have said to her would have just led to violence because he's blessed. Ryu doesn't really understand what Yuta meant by this, but still respects his words. After a brief break, our man decides to get back on his mission and asks Ryu to hand over all of his points. The ancient sorcerer is like kind of an initially confused by uh, what he means about this, but Kogain explains that a new rule was added a while back that allows players to transfer points to one another. Ryu believes he understands that's why Yuta spared their lives now, but still asks if he would have killed them without their rule. Yuta suggests that it definitely was a possibility and smiles while telling Ryu to just be grateful to his new comrade, which you know could be uh, interesting with that little comment there for what could happen in the future, little, little Yuta Ryu tag team like duo. Anyway. Thanks to the point transfers from Uro and Ryu, on top of the points he already gained from eliminating Druff and Kuroroshi, Yuta now has a total of 200 points, putting him at the halfway point in their plan to bring down the Cullen game. So that officially brings us to the end of this like arc here, or the smaller arc. In the next JJK arc, we're going back over to the Tokyo Colony, or the second Tokyo Colony, to get some of the craziest freaking hands you have ever seen with Kashimo versus Akari. Like it's actually so freaking brutal, but so damn good. If you want to get earlier access to these videos and possibly other contents like in the future that I won't release on YouTube, then check out my Patreon, which I will leave down in the description below. And if you guys like this video and want to watch more content just like it, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and also be sure to leave a like on the video. As it really helps out with pushing my content to a bunch of new amazing people. But anyway, enough of that. For now, it's been your professional degenerate, Diavolo, and I will see you all in a bit. Bye.